Welcome back to the crypto show about technology, currency, and liberty with a pinch of sticking it to the man. We're coming to you live from the Crypto BNB studios in Austin, Texas on 89.1 FM, the Logos Radio Network. And yes, we're undermining the banks and the man, but having some fun while we do it. Everything is awesome. I am sick of that intro song <laughs> that is going to drive me nuts. No, that's all right. Uh, it tries to remind me that there's still good in the world. Uh, welcome, guys, to the Crypto Show. It is uh, October 9th, 2016. Uh, to give you a little context, we are coming to you live uh, more or less during the presidential debate tonight. Uh, I think you would be better served to listen to this show than to view that debate, since uh, while it's probably going to be crazy and a lot of uh, carnival cartoon-like fun, uh, it's all theater and uh, nonsense, and it's not waste. It's not worth wasting your brain power and your two hours of your time. So, a check in to the crypto show because we have a great guest lineup tonight. It's a incredibly. Uh, uh, it's going to be a great show with uh, three incredible guests, uh, all of whom are related uh, in some way, and I'm not sure what that way is, but we'll find out. No, but uh, all of whom have uh, a, a relationship to each other that we will get into. Uh, one of our guests is in studio right now. It's Cody Wilson of Defense Distributed. He needs almost no introduction on this show. Cody, how are you? Doing very well. Thank Excellent. You for me again, great no. to be in the new studio. My first time. It was, it was great. Well, thank you. That means a lot. I appreciate sure. that. Sure. Uh, and we're actually probably going to have Cody again uh, later on this week to talk about his Let's upcoming book. Let's talk I'm about that book. Very excited about that. We may get a little bit of that later in the show too yeah. uh, to talk about. So we'll see. Hey, already already number two thousand on Amazon. Really? Not even out yet. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty impressive. That's uh, great for a coloring book. Could, exactly. Right. <laughs> could, for a pop-up <laughs> coloring could book. Could be worse for bathroom reading. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, congratulations to Cody, and like I said, we'll talk more about that. Um, our other guest is going to be Simon Dixon. Uh, he is a uh, several-time guest to the show. Uh, interesting guy with an interesting uh, service. Bank to the Future. Bank to the Future dot com minus the A. Uh, and it is a, uh, I don't want to say crowdfunding because that's not technically correct, but it is an equity uh, funding platform for certified investors. And uh, we're going to have him on shortly and we'll find out what his uh, involvement is with our main guest, uh, whom I'll get to in just a second. I do also want to remind you guys of our sponsors, uh, CryptoCompare.com, where instead of doing a news bite at the top of each segment, we're going to do all the news kind of crunched together uh, in the middle. Uh, so you get uh, a little expanded narrative. It's going to sound a little more coherent, uh, all the news together. And that way it gives us more time to talk to our guests. And uh, Hill Country Home Improvements, for all your roofing needs, they accept and prefer Bitcoin. And don't forget, LogosRadioNetwork.com. Well, our first guest is uh, a pretty famous in his own right, though many of our listeners may not know of him. So uh, that's why it's going to be a very important show. Even if you do, it's uh, he's an incredible guest uh, with... Uh, a lot of relevance to the show, both with respect to technology and to the sort of uh, politics that we discuss related to that technology. Um, he is the founder of Mega Upload, uh, which was basically an online uh, storage and uh, uh, file transfer site. Uh, it was huge in its time uh, with over a billion page views throughout its history. Uh, something like 50 million visitors per day at its height and uh, uh, consisted of like 4% of the internet at one point. Uh, and it had uh, the, it was the 13th most vis visited site on the internet at one point as well. And of course, you can find him now at his current website, Kim.com. And thus, I would like to welcome to the show, Kim.com. Kim, are you there? Hello. 
Yes, hi, how are you? Doing great. Thanks for being on the crypto show. We're very uh, pleased to have you. This is uh, quite an honor, and uh, we're very excited to talk about uh, what's going on. We're going to do the first half of the show, I think. Uh, of course, for those who don't know, discussing the background of Mega Upload and uh, your court case, and then getting into what's been going on with you more recently. Okay. So with that in mind, um, tell us tell us about yourself, um, your background, how you got into tech, uh, what Mega Upload is, and then how you came uh, to create that, and uh, we'll take it from there. Okay. So uh, I'm Kim.com. I was born in Germany. I'm now 42 years old and uh, became quite uh, early uh, in my in my youth uh, a computer nerd, a computer freak. I got my first <laughs> Commodore C16 and then oh, wow. Commodore 64, the old uh, Brett case, as, as it was called, and, uh, you know, started uh, basically quite early, was there when the Internet uh, basically was born uh, I started before the internet with dial-up modems and BBS's and things like that so I've seen it all been through the whole evolution of uh, home computers uh, and then later the internet and then later uh, you know the the servers and data centers um, always been an avid gamer so I've also uh, been through the whole evolution of gaming from pong to Pac-Man to where we are today with games like Destiny that are just super realistic and, and beautiful to play. So, uh, you know, for me, technology was always uh, the most dominant thing in my life. Uh, when I got my first computer, I realized, you know, school is really not for me. They're not teaching me anything there that is interesting me. I've identified it early on as uh, the thing of the future and something that I want to learn and, and, and want to get really good at. And that ultimately... Uh, drove me to become a hacker, to explore computer systems and understand their weaknesses and uh, find ways uh, to get around certain security procedures and things like that. And I became really good at that uh, until uh, in my juvenile years of 17 years old, I was uh, busted for uh, basically, you know, calling for free, providing people with uh, blue box access so that they could call for free and uh, all kinds of hacking exploits that I was involved in. Uh, and then, you know, I got uh, a probation sentence because I was a juvenile and the, the judge kind of saw it as uh, uh, youthful foolishness. And the, the funny thing is back at the time, in Germany, we didn't even have any hacker laws. There was no law, so they had to put it under data espionage and, and, and all kinds of uh, funny uh, laws to apply to this case. So you, uh, you basically created legal precedent in Germany, or...? Yeah, twice. Wow. <laughs> so first first with hacking, but I get to the second time a bit later. Um, so uh, from that uh, hacking experience and, and you know, having that uh, court case back in the day, um, I, I rose to a little bit of fame in Germany for it because I was the first big hacker case really that anyone has ever heard of uh, in Germany and uh, through all that attention that I got I also got a lot of attention from the very uh, companies that I hacked and they approached me and asked me you know uh, can you do penetration testing for us and can you help us out uh, making these uh, systems more secure so I turned into a a white hacker basically and started a consulting company uh, which ultimately ended up with uh, over 20 really excellent hackers that were doing work for fortune 500 companies and governments around the world uh, penetrating their networks and giving them security advice i've done that for seven years the company was called data protect we developed all kinds of uh, products during that time you know we uh, innovated firewalls i uh, was the first person to file a patent for two-factor authentication back in 1997. Oh, wow. We developed it in 1994. It's still a valid patent in the, in the U.S. Uh, patent office. I never used it for anything, though. Uh, but, you know, I pride myself with being one of the first who thought about using mobile phones for two-factor authentication. And uh, so after seven years of running Data Protect and effectively, you know, hacking every single customer we ever had, uh, I went uh, on to start a venture capital fund. I sold my 
uh, data security business to TÜV, which is Europe's largest certification company, uh, and and started a company called Kimvesto, which was my uh, investment fund. I wanted to incubate new startups. This was around the, the internet bubble, you know, where everyone was excited about uh, the the future of the internet and the big valuations that we had seen with you know companies like Yahoo and Google at the time. So I wanted to get into that. I knew that being a consultant limits me in growth, limits me to charge for hours rather than for a product. Uh, so I entered into that space and did a couple of uh, investments. I was one of the early investors in Google, in Yahoo, and some of these uh, companies that are super big today. So that helped me uh, build uh, my portfolio. Uh, but then I also invested in a company called Let's Buy It.com. And Let's Buy It.com was on the brink of bankruptcy. They needed money quickly from an investor who was willing to act uh, basically instantly. There was less than a week time to save the company and over 200 jobs. Uh, and uh, to describe Let's Buy It or Comments, basically um, a, a group buying website where people in the thousands come together to buy the same product and then they get huge discounts. Um, and there are business models today that are worth you know, billions of dollars that are listed already that have uh, followed in their suit and are now doing the same thing. Anyway, at that time, I realized this is a great opportunity. I was in my mid-20s. I wanted to make my name uh, as a venture capital investor. And I took the risk and I saved uh, the company. And because of my high profile um, that I already had in Germany at that time, um, the stock went up enormously just by announcing the investment. It went up 800%. And I was limited to the amount of shares that I could buy. I could only buy around 1.5 million worth of shares, and I wanted more. So I bought more from the market at the same price that the company gave me for my investment. So I didn't see anything wrong with that. And of course, when the stock went up by 800%, I said, look, I can basically minimize my risk now by selling down some of the stock that I bought anyway and uh, basically have a free run with this, uh, with this investment. But unfortunately, that was later turned into an in investigation for insider trading, and I was the first case in Germany to be tried for insider trading. So again, a uh, completely novel uh, situation for me. I didn't know uh, that that even existed. I didn't think that a person who is uh, saving a company and making a, a major investment to basically keep 200 jobs and a business going uh, can be seen I, as doing something wrong. I agree you know? with that. And we're coming to break with Kim.com, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Crypto Show, guys. It is October 9th, 2016. Uh, one of the best episodes, I think, of this whole year with three incredible guests, Cody Wilson of Defense Distributed here in studio with us. Uh, we uh, just brought on Simon Dixon of Bank to the Future and, of course, our primary guest, Kim.com, who was just uh, recounting for us his history uh, in the tech world and it's uh, an incredible history. He's done so much and a lot that, uh, one, you wouldn't expect from a single person, and two, uh, he's been behind a lot of the major developments uh, in uh, the tech world. And unfortunately, what comes with that is when you blaze new territory uh, in tech, in probably a, a lot of industries, you tend to blaze new territory legally because the government finds a way to uh, find problems with what you're doing because that's what the government does and persecute you. And uh, he was just... It's like going into war. The guy out front takes all the bullets, you know. It's a, that's a great analogy. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, just like with uh, Cody Wilson, just like with Ross Ulbricht... Oh, no. Off. Oh, there you go. There we go. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, a less appropriate one would be like the pioneers get all the arrows. Right? Have you heard that one? <laughs> that's racist. Yeah, that's racist. Inappropriate. Right. Pioneers get all the arrows. Oh, there I, you go. I, I'm not surprised that came from Cody Wilson. Well, Give him one of those arrowheads. Right? <laughs> Stick around. <laughs> well, um, just real quick, uh, uh, before we get back, I do want to make a quick comment, which is, you know, as far as insider trading, a lot of that is very subjective. And actually, the economist Don Boudreau of Cafe Hayek makes a great case that insider trading is not only not immoral, but is uh, economically beneficial to the market. 
And in fact, uh, I would agree to the extent that if a stock is your property, you get to do with your property what you want as long as it's not hurting other people. And that includes buying and selling. So I actually think uh, insider trading is a, is a bogus uh, legal crime, but that's a whole other story. I uh, don't know. Martha was a pretty... <laughs> <laughs> Except in the case of Martha Stewart. She was Stewart. pretty thuggish. That, 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 <laughs> that was just dubious. But uh, real quick before we get back to letting... Uh, 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 Kim.com uh, finish uh, getting into his history and the history of Mega Upload. I would be remiss not to uh, introduce Simon Dixon of Bank to the Future, Bank to the Future dot com minus the A. And Simon, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Excellent. Uh, we were a little concerned over break that we wouldn't, but we did. Uh, and Simon, I remind me, are you CEO uh, or COO? Uh, no, um, I'm the CEO co-founder. Yeah. Okay, CEO co-founder. Yeah. That's right. I just wanted to make sure I got it right. That's why I, f- I figured, but sometimes I get it wrong with our guests. Well, uh, we're really excited to have Simon on to join the discussion with Kim.com. And in the second hour in particular, we're going to find out uh, just his direct uh, relevance uh, to Kim.com's current activities and it's some exciting stuff. But let's get back. Kim, uh, you were explaining... Um, how you saved a company of 200 employees. Uh, let's get back to that and, and the rest. Yeah, so I was basically charged with insider trading without a single victim. What happened here is I saved uh, 200 jobs. I saved the business. Uh, the stock after I made that uh, investment stayed up, so no one has lost anything. <laughs> and uh, yet they decided to uh, punish me. And the reason for that was political because one of the jobs that I was doing at uh, Data Protect Times was the security of Munich Airport. And uh, I was contracted by a security agency. Uh, I was uh, obliged to secrecy. I signed uh, agreements that uh, kept me from ever talking about uh, that contract. And basically what happened, I was hired to check the security of Munich Airport prior to them presenting themselves as one of one one of the safest airports in Europe at a big conference that they were going to host in Munich. So they wanted to make sure that these claims are accurate. And I basically completely destroyed their security. I got into the airport seven times on seven different occasions. Wow. I got into airplanes, into the cargo area, into the tower, into the data center in the tower. I was everywhere. So and physical hacking, not, not cyber hacking. Yeah, social engineering, physical hacking, and some cyber hacking to basically get uh, rid of some of the gate controls. So what I did is basically completely expose that airport as uh, unsafe. And this is pre-9-11. This is before we are uh, worried about major terrorist uh, attacks on the scale that we are seeing today, right? But anyway, it made enormous waves uh, back in the day in, in Bavaria, in the state in Germany where I was living. And, uh, you know, dozens of people lost their jobs. The security chief lost his job. And, of course, in the in the security community in Munich, this was a giant uproar. Uh, press coverage was enormous. It was on all the titles of all the newspapers and magazines. And I always felt that the insider trading case against me, which was so novel and 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 wouldn't have brought against anybody else, was kind of uh, payback for. Uh, the insult that they received, even though it was an official job that I did, but I couldn't talk about it. Everyone uh, felt that, you know, I did that as a, as a joke or for fun, but it was actually a job that uh, Data Protect was engaged in. You know, and so I agree, I always, and, and real quick, sorry, I just want to say, uh, you're absolutely right, and what, what's interesting in, in comparison to the U.S., what happened there in your case in Germany is people lost their jobs when uh, security was found to be lax, and it made big news, where Whereas in the United States post 9-11, with 9-11, no one so much has lost their job within the government. And uh, uh, there was little focus in the media on uh, w- real security going on. And so that's that's a very important difference between uh, our country and other countries, it seems. Anyway, uh, go on. Yeah, I mean, I have to say that I've always uh, created 
a lot of unwanted hostility just by being successful in my job and by being <laughs> successful with what I'm doing. You know, being the CEO of Data Protect, I had meetings with the top CEOs of, of Fortune 500 companies and I would sit in their conference room and I would hand them burned CDs, uh, stacks of burned CDs with their entire email communication for the last, uh, you know, three weeks. And uh, in one case, this was uh, Daimler-Benz at the time, one of the wow. largest ger German companies. They also are a defense contractor. They build uh, weapon systems and so on. And we hacked them in a way that we had access to their entire email communications of the entire uh, group of businesses. So when I put that on the table, the panic set in, you know, and they all of a sudden they see me as an enemy, not as a consultant who's trying to help them and assist them. They realized how big of a problem this was, if this was was going to be public. And they basically forced us, me and all my employees, to sign uh, non non disclosure agreements with with massive penalties. And yeah, I mean, they paid us very well. Uh, but you know, in my job, I've always created enemies when I was just trying to uh, to help. Of course, I also enjoyed sitting there and seeing their chins drop and their faces go pale when I show them how easy it was uh, to basically take over their entire billion dollar business, you know? Yeah, to un so, undermine their hubris. Well, and we got a little bit less than two minutes till break. Um, and I like that you've talked about this because this establishes your history of being politically targeted and making enemies, like you said, for doing good, for, for helping uh, companies and people out. And I think that's not irrelevant to what later happened to you with mega upload so um go ahead with what you're going to say but let's uh let's also start uh to get into mega upload what it was all about and then we'll get into what happened uh with that and with you after that yeah so uh, with this insider trading case i felt that i was uh, very unfairly treated by uh, the German media. They basically pre predetermined my guild and uh, made it very difficult for me uh, to mount a defense. And after all of that happened, I decided, okay, I don't want to live in Germany anymore. I will start over somewhere else. And I decided to move to Asia. Uh, I lived in Hong Kong and I started uh, my new businesses there. And one of them uh, was Mega Upload, uh, and I'm going to talk to you guys about Mega Upload for a little bit, but it's probably better to start that after the break. Absolutely true, and um, very excited to uh, get into that. Um, pretty fascinating story. I can only imagine there's so much more you could tell us about your history uh, in tech and uh, how you were a pioneer and uh, how you were also targeted. And uh, but we'll find out more about the big case and the big success story which is Mega Upload, and then what might be following after that uh, to replace it, but much better uh, in the second hour. So stay tuned. There's a lot more to go. Prosecutor on you, and we're going to check out your situation. <laughs> like, to her face, to her face. And he's like, because there's no one, and he just goes and goes and goes, and he's like, and, and he's like, and we're going to figure this out because this is a disgrace, and everyone is furious. With you, blah, blah, blah. I have to admit that's pretty cool because, <laughs> I mean, I don't like Trump, but yeah. Clinton is a criminal, and she deserves yes, yes. to be told that. But hold on. She Bill goes, Clinton number two. So, uh, you know, she's like, she's trying to suffer, suffer, suffer. She gets through it, and she goes, well, you know. We should just be thankful that there's no one with Mr. Trump's uh, temperament in the Oval Office. And Ms. Trump goes, because you'd be in jail. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is awesome. This is a spectacle. It's fire, man. I'm going to have to watch this. It's uh, fire, because he, he knows he's losing. He, he knows he's just got to kill, kill, kill. <laughs> Man, something's got to, something weird's going to happen. I just know it. Something. I just this can't is, believe that, you know, everybody just doesn't uh, see that it wasn't the email. Wall. You know, it was the emails was why they, they brought out this whole thing that, that happened in 2005. Yeah, I got to, yeah, I got to learn about how much of an asshole Trump is. Like somehow this murderous, you know, butcher, <laughs> this craven Emperor Palpatine type is somehow, you know, <laughs> spotless. Did you, did well, you, see you know, the video there is that um, Ben from uh, Joy Camp did. Where he's like he edited I love himself. Those guys. He edited himself into uh, the debate between Trump and and Clinton. No, that's hilarious. And then he's like telling all of the the things about Libya and. <laughs> that is like, awesome. Is that's the that's hilarious. the conspiracy guy, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, we need to get him on the show. I love oh, that yeah? guy. Okay. He is. <clears throat> 
I'm kind of glad you're watching this while we're just to give us updates. <laughs> it's so funny. It's like it's like you're watching a football match. It, exactly. No, that's what that's how I was thinking. Of. <laughs> and I'm thinking he's gonna come up here. We're gonna watch him just kind of fold, fold, fold. Sad, sad, sad. He is putting it to her. He's in his presidential stuff here. <laughs> America has become the clown of the world. <laughs> what do you say? say? <laughs> America has become the clown of the world. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, like, uh, that's just because they took your money, Kim. That's, that's like why. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> that's why. That's just sour grapes, Kim. Yeah, no, sour I'm grapes, kidding. Kim. Why do you I'm think sorry. they have? I'm sorry. Why do you think we have uh, <laughs> clowns hiding in the woods and stuff? Man? That's a good point. It's like a real life metaphor for what's going on. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's so crazy. Hey, I've been writing in spongebob since 2012 uh, and i'm going to continue to do it uh, <laughs> i can't believe i'm missing this debate <laughs> well you know what kim we appreciate you missing the debate for us we don't really worry do. there'll be it'll be there'll be plenty of replays oh, yeah man. i i only realized it yesterday that it's on the exact same time and i'm yeah. like fuck my well, God, I'm glad you only realized it. yesterday, not earlier, so you, <laughs> so you didn't drop out. <laughs> All right, I'm let's looking look. forward to watch it. I recorded it. I know. I can't wait either. Yeah, that way you can skip through the commercials. <laughs> Welcome back to a jam-packed episode of the Crypto Show on this lovely October 9, 2016, during the presidential debates. But if you're listening, you're making the smart choice. There's no point in uh, listening to those clowns uh, duke it out because, uh, I mean, why do you want to lose brain cells? Let's earn some more brain cells by listening to our incredible guests. We've got Cody Wilson of Defense Distributed in studio. We've got Simon Dixon of Bank to the Future, banktothefuture.com on the line, and Kim.com of Kim.com as well. And uh, Kim was just telling us uh, about his uh, long history and basically subsequent to the insider trading uh, scandal, which uh, really by all reasonable accounts was uh, dubious in a form of political persecution. Uh, he then decided to leave Germany, understandably, and move to Hong Kong. And uh, uh, Kim, go ahead. And you're, you're setting the uh, uh, groundwork for a mega upload. Let's get back into it. Yeah. So I was uh, basically planning at the time after I left Germany to start something non-tech to completely disconnect myself from tech and do something else. And I always loved racing, car racing, and, and street rallies. And I don't know if you guys have heard of the Gumball 3000. Uh, it's an event that happens once a year. It's uh, uh, six days, 3,000 miles, and usually you know, wow. 120 to 150 teams competing uh, to get to the checkpoints the fastest. It's kind of like the movie uh, Cannonball Run, if you will remember that. <laughs> okay, yeah. Exactly. Where does it take so place? I wanted, so I wanted to start something like that. I wanted to have my own event for uh, that kind of format. And, uh, you know, I was sending a lot of video clips around about uh, me participating in, this, in these events. And the, the clips were quite large. And sometimes, you know, the emails would bounce back and say, hey, this file is too large uh, to send via email. So I thought, wow, I need to solve this. This is ridiculous in, the, in this time and age that uh, emails are bouncing. So I started a server where I could upload uh, these videos, get a unique URL link, and then instead of emailing the file, I just emailed the link to the recipients. And then those recipients come back to me and say, well, this is really cool. Uh, I want to use that as well. Can you create some kind of website that allows us to use that as well? Because we are all having to deal with uh, email server limitations. So I did that. I built it. I launched the site. And basically, instantly, within a week, that thing took off. Because everyone who ever received a link through Mega Upload now knew about Mega Upload and wanted to use it as well. And uh, if the word viral has any meaning at all, it's really in the context of Mega Upload because within a month, uh, you know, we had tens of thousands of users and that was wow. at a time, uh, you know, when, when sites didn't grow like crazy. Uh, and uh, within a year, we had millions of users. Wow. And so just through word of mouth. Week, yeah, just, just, no, we've never spent a single penny on advertising. I believe that. Yeah. That's it incredible. Was a pure viral growth. 
and uh, uh, you know the server infrastructure grew, the bandwidth requirements grew. We were one of the biggest uh, bandwidth uh, customers uh, of backbone providers in the world. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, at the peak, we uh, were responsible for 4% of global internet traffic. Wow. That is massive. That is a massive <laughs> amount of data that we were shifting around every day for, for our users. And this popularity uh, was a thorn in the eye of uh, the content industry. You know, they couldn't uh, believe that a website as simple as ours uh, was so popular and could so easily be used by people, uh, you know, to infringe on their rights. Um, the laws were pretty clear. If a user does something like that, it's uh, the obligation is with the content owner to report links uh, to the service provider, and then the service provider takes down the links. And we've done that. We had a takedown compliance of 99.999%. We went even wow. further. We gave uh, we gave uh, content owners, uh, over 150 of them, direct delete access to our servers. So they could go in, paste the link without us doing any kind of checks, and the link would be taken offline instantly. A service that no other service provider uh, gave to, for example, Hollywood at the time. Yet, they were still not happy. They, they uh, didn't like the laws that they currently had to comply with, the, namely the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which basically puts the burden on the content owners. And Hollywood and the cartel around it, the copyright cartel, as well I said. call them, well said. Um, they then tried to fix this politically. They wanted a new law. So what did they do? They hired Chris Dodd, a former senator, best friend of Joe Biden, very well connected with his relationships in the White House, including Hillary Clinton uh, and Barack Obama. He was actually on the ticket to be vice president, uh, but Joe Biden got the job. Oh, wow. And uh, so Hollywood hired this guy to be their rainbow maker within uh, the White House to get a new law passed. And he worked uh, on SOPA. You might all remember the Stop Online Piracy Act that attracted so much uh, attention in the public that it had to be uh, shut down uh, because of the protests. They just, renamed, the they just renamed it over and over and over until they right. got it passed. Right, CISPA and PIPA, right? CISPA, PIPA, ACTA. Yeah. yeah, well, they haven't got it passed, uh, and SOPA was basically Chris Dodd's baby. And in parallel to SOPA, Chris Dodd got the White House to basically do a pay-for-play mm -hmm. uh, law enforcement action against Mega Upload, because uh, Hollywood is the most significant contributor financially to the Democrat Party. And it's not just uh, the money that they bring to the party. It's also the endorsements of the Hollywood stars. It's the media that Hollywood controls. A lot of TV, radio is controlled by these uh, companies that are members of the MPAA. Including so they the are show. very powerful. And Chris Dodd threatened the White House openly and said, if you don't help us keep our jobs... Uh, here in this industry, uh, why should we help you keep your jobs? So uh, on that uh, note, uh, it is important to understand that Barack Obama was trying to get reelected for a second term. The, the polling was really close. Uh, it was a very tight race. And if Obama would have lost the support from Hollywood, uh, it could have uh, uh, basically allowed the Republicans to get the White House. So they went in and uh, decided to make this uh, the first criminal case of its kind, where they are saying that uh, I am personally responsible for the actions of third parties, of our users and their infringement, and that I should be criminally liable for that. And the way they did that is Joe Biden, who himself says he is the, the world's best friend of Chris Dodd, has put his former lawyer, uh, Neil McBride, into the Department of Justice to be a U.S. attorney. He put him there, and then he asked him to run this case against me. And it's the same prosecutor, by the way, that is prosecuting Assange and Snowden. Oh, wow. So it's ve that's why we know it's very political 
you know, very targeted. Uh, this same prosecutor was in the White House briefing the chief of staff of Joe Biden about the developments in my case a week before Biden had a meeting with all the studio executives, so all the CEOs of the big studios like Disney, Warner, you name it, including in the meeting one guy from Hong Kong who is an extradition expert. So we knew immediately oh, wow. what this meeting was all about. The fix was so, in. The fix was in. And we know all this because, fortunately, Obama, when he announced that he's going to, his administration is going to be more, more transparent than any other, has made the <laughs> visitor logs of the White House public. So we were able to access them, find all these traces of all these meetings. We found out how many times Dot went to the White House since he became a lobbyist and all these things, which paint a pretty clear picture that this whole action against Mega Upload originated in the White House because Hollywood hired the senator who was putting enormous pressure on the White House uh, with the financial power and the, the election power that uh, Hollywood brings to the table. That's and they incredible. Used that, yeah, and they used that to basically create this case against me. Now, a number of experts have spoken out against this case, including... Well, before we get to that, to sorry to interrupt, yeah. we are coming to break with Kim.com. What an incredible story. There's more incredible elements yet to be uh, talked about, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. That's kind of the same way they did it for Ulbrich with uh, Chuck Schumer. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> And that's what's so creepy is like it, it's not just passive uh, judicial or uh, criminal actions. These are like essentially like mini conspiracies from all the way up to the top. There's, you know, the, his whole that whole raid that they did on his compound. You know, apparently it was just like prompted by MPAA and like lobbied for by the by Hollywood. Like it wasn't even. It was kind of extrajudicial, as I as I remember it. And, well, and you know what's so appropriate about that? That is very Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> the, and this footage of how they did it, they were like con they conspicuously recorded it, and Kim got the footage and stuff. So there was something very, you know, Kim put a song out about it, and it became three four cycles of of media. Oh wow! Uh, it was a Hollywood way to take. You it should down. when he gets and, to and, that, and you and should and bring that point up. The other about thing is, like, in, in comparison with the Silk Road. It's all of these other sites pop up after the Silk Road, and it's not really, you know, they right. trust him, and he's getting like five years, ten years, whatever. You chop off one branch, ten other branches come and the, up. And the place, same thing yeah. has happened with Kim.com. All these other sites have popped up, and they're not doing the same thing to them. Yeah. What's, what's the timing of Napster in all of this? Tell me what? Napster? No, Napster, yeah. Huh. Well before Mega Upload. Yeah, because Napster was around 2000, I think, 2001. Yeah, that mm -hmm. shutdown was in, like, early 2000s. Yeah, because I, I remember... Yeah, but you need to remember all of those are civil cases. I'm the first criminal case. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, that's a really yeah. good point, yeah. Me yeah, Metallica was so boss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Jens Hetfield was so did mad. You watch, um, did you watch the uh, documentary by uh, what? Alex Winter of, about Napster downloaded? downloaded? I still haven't, I still oh, haven't man, seen it. Awesome. You only interviewed him. I didn't get a chance yeah. to watch it. It's good. It's really I need good. to. I need to. We need to have him back on eventually. He's yeah. He, he should come on any time, right? He's real friendly. Yeah. Yeah. He's doing. He's doing a, a doc on uh, Frank Zappa right now. He cool. should be doing a doc about. He That's should be right. doing a doc about Kim. That's what he should be doing. I know, right? Well, maybe oh, next, man. right? Kim, Kim's Kim, have you met? Have you met story, Alex huh? Winter yet? Yeah, yeah. I've uh, spoken with him. Yeah. Yeah, he did the doc about the Silk Road. He he should totally be doing one about what about your situation. Yeah, no, I watched. It. He's well aware of my case. Yeah, uh, we're talking every now and then. Yeah. yeah, but there's already a documentary being made, which is uh, about, uh, to be released in January, I think. Oh, awesome! Oh, cool. We'll have to mm -hmm. cover that. All right, well, we're coming back, Deb. Whenever you're ready, bring us back. <laughs> Welcome back, guys, to The Crypto Show, October 9, 2016. During the presidential debates, our guests are Cody Wilson of Defense Distributed, Simon Dixon of Bank to the Future com, and uh, Kim.com of Kim.com and Mega Upload Fame. 
And we were just talking about Mega it's Upload. so crazy that he was born with that name. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> just what, I a, what an incredible <laughs> coincidence. What, he wasn't? Oh. We'll have to ask him about <laughs> no, that later. No, no, the, the dot coms of Bavaria, right? That's the... Oh, right, no, the, no, these are the <laughs> Soufal.com. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's the yeah, phone.com of Bavaria, an uh, yeah. aristocratic family related to the... Uh, we've, we, we've done the, the KYC on Kim. It's his legal name. <laughs> yeah. Here you are, Mr. Uh, I Regulator. Never re- yeah, he I checked out. It is. It is in my passport. It's my. It's my legal name. No, I know. I remember <laughs> watching a, an interview with you, and you uh, said that. That's pretty cool. I think actually. Yeah, yeah I like that. Well, and uh, I mean, it almost real quick. We'll get back to what we were talking about, but it almost goes without. It really doesn't need to be asked. I don't think. But why did you change your name to Kim.com? Well, because I have everything to thank the internet for. You know, the internet made me <laughs> like who that. I am made me successful and gave me the best times of my life so it's a, it's basically you know, a homage to the internet that's really cool i like that and then of course you know if anyone needs to find you they it's not hard <laughs> they don't yeah, they, exactly and before kim.com my name was kim schmitz which is for asians impossible <laughs> to so I was like, let's do them a favor and change the name to something that they can actually. Well, I'm going to change. I'm going to change my name to Kim.net and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, <that's good. laughs> you might get a, a million visitors out of that. That's not bad. Kim.net. At least there are no R's or L's in your name. That would have been even harder for the Asians. What? Um, well, so uh, just real quick, I want to comment before we get back in. So clearly. Similar to Ross Ulbricht of the Silk Road, there was a con- the uh, concept of transferred intent involved in his case where Kim.com himself is responsible for the actions of other people, which doesn't make sense in any moral or logical way and therefore shouldn't make sense in any legal way. But that morals and logic don't usually enter into the equation uh, when it comes to uh, – the government in politically persecuting people, so that's not surprising. And I also want to yeah, add... Yeah, but there are, two, there are two big differences, right, in the Ulbricht case and in my case. Oh, go ahead, yeah. In my case, in my case, it has, not, it has nothing to do with drugs or other illicit things that could be shipped around. It is purely copyright. Oh, well, sure. In my well, case, fair enough. Yeah, right. for sure. And in my case, in the history of uh, anything to do with copyright, these cases were always civil. And there's not yeah, even point. a criminal statute against secondary copyright infringement. So what they're doing here is completely novel and basically a heck of the law. They're trying to do something here that they don't even have a law to do it with. That's a really good point. So in, in some respects, it's even worse. You're right. The precedent was uh, civil, and uh, and they're really grasping for straws with with your case. Well, so and just outside the jurisdiction, just just a little bit. <laughs> exactly. And we'll, and we'll exactly. get to, yeah, exactly. Especially we'll get into that too uh, coming you, up. Did you see they got the back page? Guy, yeah, yeah, we were just talking yeah. about that the, the other day. Yeah, isn't it the same kind of transferred intent justification? I mean, it, not, exactly, not like right? But a lot like Goldberg. They're but. like accusing him of of running like a uh, what is sex prostitution, prostitution ring, ring or and, whatever, uh, child, yeah, yeah. Uh, child prostitution and all that kind of so stuff. That's, yeah, that's, that's classifieds for you. Yeah, there you go. So we might we might have him on if we can. We'll see. But I, I just want to add to real quick before we get back. Um, we talked about Hollywood's involvement here, and that's no surprise. And, you know, this is not simply a passive legal process. It's clear that this was active uh, going after Kim all the way from the top of the federal government, from the White House. I mean, essentially a mini conspiracy. And what's particularly interesting about that is keep in mind, and this is something we discussed the other one of, uh, one of the recent episodes, it's not simply Hollywood in its uh, copyright in its support of the Democratic Party. Hollywood has deep ties to the military-industrial complex. And we discussed that with the fact that if, uh, as was supported by uh, a journalist that we uh, had dinner with a while back, um, any Hollywood movie that uses uh, the Pentagon services for you, you know, showing like a jet or, or a military anything, uh, the the military, the Pentagon, and this is true also of the FBI and the CIA, they have the uh, option to go through and edit the script of Hollywood movies, and there so there are deep ties between the military industrial complex and Hollywood, so. 
this is, uh, a, a, in a sense, a lot deeper and more important as far as uh, power politics and money go than you might even expect. But anyway, let's get... Yeah, that. Hollywood is also the biggest recruiter for the U.S. military. With That's the a good heroic, point, sure. Uh, sure. Uh, soldier movies, the absolutely. Guns movies, sure. Yeah. yeah, look at the recent uh, sequel to uh, Independence Day as a great example. Uh, well, let's yeah. get back. Um, so... Uh, so the the fix was in. Uh, it was clear they were sort of inadvertently telegraphing what they were going to do to you. So uh, I guess uh, lead us up to that fateful day when uh, things, you know, s s hit the fan. Well, no one ever had any expectation that anything uh, like that would be possible, right? I mean, we were worried because of the rhetoric by Hollywood that at some point there might be some civil case uh, against us. But no one ever thought uh, that a raid would be possible. Now, let me talk about the raid. I mean, this is outrageous, uh, given that this is actually a civil copyright case. So what they did, they flew in with two helicopters uh, they had 72 people on the ground with assault rifles. New Zealand used their special tactic groups, which is a, a, an anti-terrorism group that is trained, uh, you know, to free hostages in terror situations. <laughs> Anti-terrorism. Uh, and, and they arrived at our property with, with uh, sniper rifles, with assault rifles, with attack dogs uh, to take down a guy who they say is responsible for the copyright infringement of others. There's nothing in my indictment that alleges that I'm a direct infringer. I've, in fact, never, ever infringed on anybody. Uh, I, you know, I buy all my stuff on iTunes and have spent over $20,000 uh, in the five years before the raid on content. So they're not saying I'm the pirate. They're saying I am responsible for the actions of others, right? So they do this unbelievable raid, uh, pull everyone out in the rain, my wife seven months pregnant with, wow. with twins, pointing guns at my staff, at my kids, scaring everybody, yelling at everybody. Uh, and I made my way into a panic room. My mansion had a, had a panic room and we had a security protocol. And when the banging happened at my door, I didn't know who was uh, trying to get in. So I made my way to the panic room. Once I heard the shout outs of police, police, I disengaged the lock of the panic room and I waited inside for them to come in because I didn't know if I, if I like pop out the secret door, which is hidden in a closet, if they would like shoot me. So I waited for them to come in and it took them the special tactic groups, anti-terror police needed 15 minutes to find out where I was. <laughs> Man, those are so crack special forces types. Uh, yeah. <laughs> why the over? Why the overkill with 72 people and all these assault rifles? Is it because they saw you had 150,000 kills on a Modern Warfare 3? <laughs> like, yes. were, they, were they scared yes. of you because they thought you were this like mass murderer on a video game or that, what? That's the shotgun yes. he and was the, actually holding. The, was it a video game <laughs> shotgun? I guess so. Kim, do you think they're just trying to impress the United States? That's exactly. Point. That is what happened here, because while this whole raid was going on, I mean, not just the United States, it was also a message uh, through the media around the world. We are the U.S. Yeah. We consider copyright a matter of national security. We're going to fuck you up if you don't do what we want. OK. And uh, this whole raid had a live feed. It's good TV. The helicopter was filming the whole thing. Uh, there were cops with antennas on their backs uh, transmitting live footage. And it all went uh, back to Washington to the FBI command center. And I bet Chris Dodd was sitting there jerking <laughs> off while it happened. <laughs> because, because that was his script. He wrote the script He's losing it, this <sighs> whole case. You know, they made this a Hollywood-style uh, uh, raid. Yeah, uh, great point. Yeah. Just like Cody said on break, exactly. It'll probably yeah, so, end up being footage in a new movie. Yeah, so they, they, were, they were watching all of this live, and once we realized that, uh, we basically uh, subpoenaed through court action the New Zealand authorities, and we got access to all that video. So that's why I was able to show that's the scary. world uh, this whole raid in full HD uh, so everyone could see the ridiculousness of it. Oh, you're you know? kidding. Like, so, so you made it accessible, the, the footage of the raid? 
Yeah, so you can watch the whole raid, uh, nicely edited, of course, with some nice music that I made <laughs> uh, on, on my YouTube channel. Uh, and the video is simply called The Raid. So if you go to YouTube and you, you search for Kim.com The Raid, you can watch the thing. It's over, already been viewed over a million times, and the comments are pretty clear. Everyone thinks it's completely outrageous. But this was all paid for by Hollywood. And this is a completely corrupt uh, uh, prosecution against a side that could only ever get in civil trouble, you know? These are civil cases. And the U.S. prosecutor is using the DMCA and quoting it in his indictment as if this is some kind of criminal code. It's not. It's purely civil. And we have safe harbor protections, which say that Internet service providers cannot be criminally liable for wow. the actions of their users. They just completely overrid all of that and went ahead and did this raid anyway. That's dictator. You know, that's the classic definition of dictatorship is there's no rule of law. They just simply ignore the laws and they make it up as they go. And they just uh, pretend like a crime, something that isn't a crime is a crime and they go with it. And that's enough. And especially if they can convict you in the court of public opinion, just like they did with Ross Ulbricht, uh, absolutely did in his case, it's so much easier than for, for them to, to go on with a criminal conviction. The judge Even again, like he yeah. said, where there is no crime on the books. The judge literally stated that she was setting precedents. Yeah. Which is just crazy. Well, we're coming to break. You know, Kim, when we get back, a related aspect of this that I remember reading is that there was some illegal spying being done on you that yeah. enabled them to actually raid you in the first place. And this is really important, I think. It goes without saying, not just with respect to this case, but with respect to uh, the American citizenry and people all around the world and how governments are increasingly doing just that type of thing and how ominous it is. So when we get back, let's talk about that and more. Stay tuned. Kim.com, Cody Wilson, and Simon Dixon. We'll be right back. What's he's doing good? Yeah, she tried to compare herself to Abraham Lincoln a minute ago. <laughs> 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 like, managing Congress, is he hearing this? No, I heard, I heard somebody laugh. Yeah. But, uh, oh, Kim laughed. She yeah. tried to compare herself to Abraham Lincoln, and, and she goes, uh, Trump's like, Yeah, only folks. the beard. Yeah, folks, <laughs> the honest, beard. Nice. He goes, Honest Abe over here, and the, and the whole crew. <laughs> Honest Abe. Yeah, he's like, yeah, Honest Abe. And, yeah. uh, he's just killing it, man. Man, I can't wait to watch this. <laughs> you know, let's just cut the show short. Let's just I'm go sorry. watch it. No, I'm I was sorry. kidding. No, no. It's just, he's, he's real comfortable under pressure, man. He's, <laughs> oh, I don't doubt it. This is do or die for him, and he's doing all right. Oh, this is a long break, right? Um, yeah. Or I'm going to the rest. Yeah, yeah. It says you got 20 seconds. Yeah, but it goes back. Uh, it reverts back and adds, adds another two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough time for your mom, Chris. Oh, I can get in there and get it so, done. So, Cody, what's with the... I, I huh? went to your uh, shop the other day, and there was a CNC. Oh, yeah, you seen it in my machine shop? Yeah, it's like the size of a fucking Suburban. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm moving on up, dude. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck We're cranking, buddy. No, we, I'm making a whole lot more of our own parts, you know, in-house. Yeah. And, we were. Uh, this was when uh, Sheftal had those doves, and uh, we were having the uh, doves wrapped in bacon with uh, jalapenos. And I noticed the skylight there. I'm like, damn. You like that skylight? Yeah, I'm like, man, that's going to look so cool when the ATF comes busting through there because you <laughs> know they're the not going to come through the that's door. That's the joke. They're like, that's the kill zone, guys. There's the kill zone. <laughs> Kim knows about that. <laughs> We're going to hear a, like a loud buzzing. Front door's wide open, yeah. but hey, do uh, you guys mind if we climb up on the roof? It's going to look way no, cooler if we come through here. That is a joke. Everyone's made that at this point. But. <laughs> yeah, man. When did you come out there? A couple days ago? Um, I brought Joel some uh, wristbands for ACL. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I went to ACL this year. Did you? Yeah, it was great. I, I didn't go. I, a friend of mine gave me two sets of wristbands, and uh, I gave one to Harlan and the other one to Joel. It was a good time, man. Yeah. It was cool of you to give that away like that. I wasn't going to go. So. I saw him in Shocker there. Yeah. Yeah, that's what... Uh, yeah, it was good to see them go. So. But yeah, dude, we've done some uh, capital acquisition. I've seen, I, I noticed, <laughs> man. I noticed the, the new place is, is pretty great, man. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a step up. Oh, I saw the bid. That's if right. Harlan gives us any problems, man, we're going to move the studio, the studio right. to DD. Be great. <laughs> I, got a, I got a room I can knock out the wall, and we can do it there if you want. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. 
live from the bins distributed with the I've thought about it with, with the things in the back. I'll try to like take it as a write off or something. Like I'll just I'll we'll fund the show and take it as a write off. Mm-hmm. It's like marketing expenses or something. You know um, what? What I was trying to tell you earlier about the the you know if you did a Kotstev type deal <sighs> at Acapulco or. She oh, goes down there and does yeah. the whole presentation, send and you Paloma. can sell some unit, sell some units, and we should and probably you, send Paloma. And yeah. you and you pop you should. in. That'd be cool. And just have you pop in for a quick spell. Except when you lose your passport and you have to be smuggled back into the country. You had to smuggle yourself back into the country. He smuggled me back that into the country. That is crazy. How did you, s- you just put him in the truck? I smuggled him in to the U.S. because he didn't have a passport. So you just and put him in the truck bed? What'd you do? Mm-mm. So... We had a resident alien with us. Uh-huh. He had his little cheap card, and he just let him right in. No problem. Mm-hmm. He, he couldn't even tell it was him uh-huh. on the picture. We have to show our, our driver's license and our passport. Chris doesn't have his passport. Oh, gringo. So we made, up this, <laughs> we made up this story about the military robbed us and took his passport because he refused to Which the to first pay. part was true. The military did they, rob they us. They did rob but us. He's like, come on down to Acapulco, Cody. Great time. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, they robbed well, us for fun. <laughs> hey, it was true. cheaper than a parking You're okay in Acapulco proper, but if you try to drive back, that's where the problem is. Don't drive to Acapulco. I, you're insane to have driven there. Like You really are insane. Well, no, it, it was, was insane fun. to drive. There, but I had I, I didn't I have a lot less. of options once I lost my passport. Oh, I, I lost it the day I, literally the when I arrived at the airport. Within ten minutes, I lost the passport. Right. I, I'm an idiot. Oh, great music coming back in too. <laughs> no good point. All right, uh, Deb, bring us back when you're ready. The government can't be trusted. No, especially say the, it ain't true. What's it's that? It's true. The government can't be trusted. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not buying it. <laughs> it's like, well, duh. I'm not buying it. Especially the American government. And real quick before we get back, we were just talking about uh, Kim.com's, the raid on his house by authorities was 72 men, which is total overkill. Uh, <laughs> you know, automatic weapons, uh, just the full works and how Hollywood style it was, like Kim and uh, Cody pointed out. And it's interesting, too, how the government uh, tied into Hollywood mixes Hollywood and fiction and real life together to where people, like, in a sense, can't tell the difference. And it has a profound psychological effect on people. Maybe something we can explore in a future episode. But it's it's just really perverse how over the top they make things, uh, including in this raid for a man who... Literally committed no crime, according to the books, according to uh, the legal, you know, codex, if you will. And even if he had, it's not like you know he was uh, the criminal kingpin of some giant drug network. And even and, you know, even then, like, uh, I mean, drugs should should not be illegal, in my opinion. But. Um, it, it's it, for over copyright. It's such overkill. But what makes it worse, and I want Kim to get into this, is it, it may not have even come to this without uh, the government of New Zealand uh, committing an illegal act. And Kim, uh, get into that for us. Okay. So first of all, a raid like this has never happened before in New Zealand. New Zealand is a pretty laid-back country. You know, quite boring, actually, and you wouldn't expect anything like this. It's all hobbits and elves. I know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But the prime minister over here, he is also the minister of tourism. And one of the biggest drivers of tourism in New Zealand is uh, where the the Lord of the Rings movies, which were (laughs) shot in New Zealand. And at the same time, the planning uh, uh, for the raid went on. Uh, John Key was in negotiations with Warner to do the Hobbit movies, uh, the trilogy mm, also nice. in New Zealand to drive you know tourism and to increase the the profile with Hollywood to do more filming here. So completely corrupt, the door was open uh, for Hollywood to come in with this action script and uh, because the White House is involved and it was the top tier, Uh, of U.S. leadership, you know, New Zealand couldn't help themselves. They just wanted this so badly, and they wanted to show their American friends what they can do. So 
on top of the raid, they've also spied on me illegally. And New Zealand is a member of the Five Eyes or Ecolon. Uh, and mm. they utilize, and now get this, this is the best part actually of the whole story. Uh, you know how the NSA has this massive spy machinery that we now know about because of the Snowden leaks mm. and a system called PRISM and X Key Score. And that was designed to fight terrorism, to find uh, the worst of the worst, to prevent terrorism attacks. And I'll get this, they used that very system in a civil copyright case against me and spied on me illegally, basically typed in all my selector data, my phone numbers, my email addresses, everything into this NSA spy cloud. And the New Zealand equivalent to the NSA called the GCSB downloaded all that data. And on top of it, they turned my iPhone into an open mic and recorded every wow. bit of... Uh, communications for over a month and when i found out about it and he pressed them in court about it the the cop who knew about it committed perjury and wouldn't admit it and then later through the court process we found out that it actually went on and the prime minister of new zealand had to apologize to me because he had Good. to admit that this was unlawful uh, spying and that just, this should never have happened and then a week later they draft a new bill That's right. and pass it through parliament to make it legal to spy on New Zealand residents. That's the kind of Are prime you minister serious? A hundred percent serious. Yeah. The so duplicity the kind of prime the, minister we're dealing oh, with here in New Zealand. The criminality. That's ridiculous. And we'll go ahead and Completely make that retroactive. Completely corrupt and criminal. Do I? But here's here's what I need you guys to understand because you are in the U.S. You uh, understand about this NSA spy cloud that they have created, which basically commits mass surveillance every day, breaching all of our basic human rights to privacy. And they say to us, they are doing it to fight terrorism. <sighs> Yet in reality, they are hiring these services to crooks in Hollywood who want to extend their copyright extremism, extremism mm -hmm. agenda. So they basically hired out their law enforcement apparatus, their Department of Justice, and their spy cloud to help out a lobbyist. It's like mercenaries or mafia. And just real quick, you know, they're blurring the lines between terrorism and other forms of criminality or even lack thereof. And that's part of the thing, too, is make everything something that could potentially have an anti-terror law enforcement action against it. And that's what that, among many things, is what's really disturbing. Was that, what was that, uh, the NSA, the only part of government that listens? <laughs> <laughs> good here's, for, good for the ladies out there. Thing, right? The easiest way for us to get the 33,000 deleted Clinton emails is to call the NSA yeah, because yeah, they have yeah. all of them right now in the spy cloud. All it takes is to type in Clinton's email address into X key score, and it's all there. Yeah. All the deleted stuff is right there, and yet here they are uh, using this stuff in a copyright case, but not in other really important corruption cases or against bankers that were causing the last uh, big financial crisis or other things, but they are using it in a copyright case Right. Uh, major, I'd like to uh, see lobby, James lobby. Comey of the FBI. Uh, well, now I know how that. to. Yeah, exactly. Now I know how to keep we everybody. Now I know how to keep everybody out of my email. I just CC Hillary Clinton, and no one will read it. <laughs> yeah. And, and by CC, you mean <laughs> confidential. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is that what that C stands for? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. I'm the Secretary of State, but I didn't know what the C stood for. <laughs> but yeah, you'll never see James Comey subpoena that from the NSA, and that's uh, such a good point, Kim. Yeah. Now, let me give you just a, a short list, and I, don't, I will not spend too much time on it, about other unlawful activity uh, by the Please. U.S. and the New Zealand government. So they spied on me illegally, and that was uh, basically proven in court. Uh, they uh, issued unlawful search warrants. We had one judgment that said the search warrants were unlawful. Uh, they seized my assets in New Zealand without a hearing, which is completely unlawful. Wow. They seized them and uh, later said, oh, sorry, where well, there should have been a hearing where he can defend himself against the seizure. We forgot that part. So that was also <laughs> completely unlawful. Uh, then the FBI, right after the raid, 
the New, Z New Zealand authorities allowed them to make clones of my hard drives and then ship them by FedEx to the United States, where the treaty, the extradition treaty says, you can't do that. You can't wow. ship any of the evidence until the extradition is concluded or there is an official ministerial order to send it away. The FBI didn't give a fuck about that. They just copied it all and shipped it over to the United States. Then a judge here found that that was unlawful and that they should not use any of that stuff and ship it back. Of course, they didn't ship it back. Yeah, too little instead, too late. Instead, they used the communications that were on these hard drives in a supplementary indictment. Uh, basically, it's called the record of case. So they are using stuff that they shipped away illegally where a New Zealand judge found you can't use it. This is how arrogant... <sighs> The United States is dealing with it. Yeah. And because they know how weak this case is, how novel it is, how outspoken the professionals are against it. We have a, a, an expert opinion from a Harvard Law School professor who says this whole case is bogus. It's a sham. Uh, and in order to win, the U.S. government declared me a fugitive. I'm legally, just get this, I'm legally fighting the extradition process in New Zealand under my treaty rights. I'm legally fighting it. It's my right to fight against it. I've never been to the U.S., not even as a tourist, wait. not once, and they have declared me a fugitive wait, wait, wait. of the law. Hey, me... Wait a minute. It gets even better. <laughs> they declared me a fugitive of the law in the United States in order to seize all my global assets. They have forfeited all my assets without a hearing. Forfeiture means it's gone. The U.S. government owns it now. I haven't had a single hearing day on the merits of this case, yet I've already lost all my assets around oh. the world. We're talking, you know, over $100 million oh gone. Oh, my God. Because they declared me a fugitive. And the reason they did that is because they wanted to make sure that I don't have money to defend myself. And now I have to go on for another minute because this is really important no, that you get this. This is the craziness of it. The Hong Kong court said, we don't want to hear anything about this forfeiture nonsense. We don't do that here because my, I don't have any assets in the US. They are in Hong Kong and New Zealand. And then the Hong Kong court released money that I can use for my legal defense to pay my lawyers, including US lawyers and experts. And then the US government threatened my lawyers or any lawyer in the U.S. to receive those funds because they say they now belong to the United States. So my lawyers would commit a criminal act if they take the money that was released officially by the Hong Kong and New Zealand courts to have them paid. They would go to jail if they took that money. So effectively, if I ever do get extradited, I will not have a penny to pay for U.S. lawyers and experts. And they are doing that because they know if I have a defense team, they are going to lose this case and it's going to be egg all over their faces and they're going to be completely embarrassed. So this is how far the U.S. is willing to go to win when they know that they actually don't have a case. They Man, did, that is they, so evil. They, they did something very similar to Jeslyn Raddick, who was... Uh, oh, the whistleblower, the, yeah. The, the lawyer for the whistleblowers. Every, everywhere that she went to get a job, they would you know, attack the firm and, and get her fired. <clears throat> it's persecution. So now this, she's Snowden's lawyer. So. Yeah. They, they have done the same thing, by the way. When we uh, look for lawyers in the U.S., the moment those lawyers contacted the DOJ to introduce themselves, they called the big firms and said, well, you know, this is, uh, uh, you have a conflict of interest. You have worked for the content industry before. Yet at the same time, <laughs> the judge that is on my case is a former Disney lawyer. It's completely Oh, there's no ridiculous. conflict of interest there. Don't there worry. Is, no, absolutely not. How, <laughs> could, how could there be a conflict, right? <laughs> And uh, here's the crazy thing about this courthouse in Alexandria, where my court is, uh, uh, is based. In that courthouse, every day there is a judge assigned to new cases coming in. So by doing that, the DOJ could basically pick their judge by just waiting for the day on which my judge, his name is O'Grady, uh, is available uh, uh, you know, with that task. 
And that's how they picked him. And they picked the guy who is pro copyright, who worked for Disney oh, uh, before, who was a partner Damn. in a law firm that that says, uh, you know, Walt Disney Corporation is our biggest client. And this is the guy who is my judge and the <laughs> lawyers. They are saying have a conflict of interest. Did this I say the how... fix was in? <laughs> Wait, so the guy yeah, it's ridiculous. The guy that is defending Goofy is the one who's defending you? <laughs> no, the guy who's defending Goofy is attacking me. It's the <laughs> judge <laughs> who has ordered that no funds should be released for my defense. The servers are deteriorating in, in the data center, powered off. Users are losing their data. He has not ruled on our motion to dismiss. He has allowed a, an indictment this is all against criminal. the holy... Listen, well, we're, we're coming to break, so we'll get back to this company. on the other side. This is all criminal. It's crazy. We'll be right back. <clears throat> wow. Oh, my God. Princess Ariel's lawyer? Oh, shit. I'm glad you're getting <laughs> <laughs> Princess Ariel's lawyer. I'm glad you're getting into so much detail because I like when I did research for this. I didn't, you know, so much of this did not come up in my research, and it's just, oh, it's just disgusting. It is. It is totally disgusting. This is my reality for the last five years. You know? Oh, and actually, when we get back, I'm going to ask you. Then uh, you already mentioned how much of your assets have been seized, but. Uh, how much time you might be facing. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of that. Let's see. And then uh, I think from that we can transition into what uh, right. Meganet and Bank to the Future. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bless you. And then... Uh, I need I need another about five minutes. There are two more important points. Absolutely. Oh, of course. Yeah, of no course. problem. Then, absolutely. And then we can move uh, into uh, the other. Yeah, absolutely. Stuff. I was just saying, uh, you know, as a. I know. I've watched. I watched the other interviews and stuff, and I never heard. All of yeah, this some stuff. of this so stuff. This I'm surprised. Like, like, like this yeah, is, you got to read torrent. Read torrent freak. You know, 60 Minutes came out to New Zealand to interview me. They were here for seven days. We did probably 30 hours of, of interviews. It was crazy. And they had all this information and in the end they made a hit piece against me because they are owned by uh, a Hollywood studio. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Well, we are um, not owned by anyone. In fact, the only way that this network stays on air is it's fighting the government to stay on air. So... Oh wow! <clears throat> it's uh, some people may call it pirate, but it's unlicensed. Ah, okay. So yeah, the people that run the network, they just literally file briefs and and fight against the government to stay on air. And now that you've told me, I've probably committed another crime by aiding the pirate. <laughs> yeah, right, no doubt. <laughs> uh oh. Oh no! Yeah. Oh, and across international borders. Ooh. You ready? We got to we got to get to Mega yeah. when you release Mega cuz then we got to get to yeah, yeah. we got to get to talk about how he took my yeah. gun files off of his side. Oh, they took your gun files off of his <laughs> yeah. side? Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Well, this would be awesome. <laughs> it's not too much of a t touchy issue. Yeah. But well, I mean, I know why I did it, but yeah, we'll yeah. You it. ready? All right. Yeah, let's get back. Uh bring us back Deb. Apparently everyone's saying Trump won this thing. It's not even over. Welcome back, guys, to the Crypto Show. We're talking with uh, Kim.com of Kim.com, uh, Cody Wilson of Defense Distributed, and Simon Dixon. And uh, in just a little bit, we'll get to where Simon Dixon intersects with Kim.com and even where Cody Wilson intersects with Kim.com, something he just actually told us. And you forgot to announce the other guest in studio, Kim.net. <laughs> and, Dan, and Danny Wilson with Kim.net. Please drive traffic to that site. Uh, if you can even get a fraction of uh, what Kim.com gets uh, or make an upload, then uh, we'll be very happy. If I just get his trolls. <laughs> yeah, that'd be millions probably. Well, real quick, um, I want to make a couple of points before we get back. Uh, Kim.com was uh, counted as a fugitive by the U.S. government, and I just want to say, to be fugitive, don't you have to have been somewhere and then leave it to be a yes. fugitive? So, like, that's exactly the definition in any dictionary, but they don't care about that. Right? Yeah, Kim.com has never been to the U.S., but he is a fugitive, meaning he has been to the U.S. And as a matter of fact, escaped it, which recount, that doesn't make sense. Recount the pin post on on uh, Kim's Twitter. 
Yeah, oh, real quick. Actually, that was pretty... I love that. Hold on one sec. Real quick. I'm sure Kim knows it. <laughs> what the, the pin post on your Twitter, what is that? I never lived there. I never traveled there. I had no company there. But all I worked for now belongs to the U.S. Yeah. And and that's a hundred plus million dollars that he earned legitimately, helping people. Oh no, you didn't build that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what Obama would say. And um, uh, you know, and then they're they're basically denying him due process by denying him funds for a legal defense and by intimidating any potential lawyer uh, from helping him. And that itself is a huge violation. Well, let's get back. Uh, Kim, I know you had more to say. I think that should be reversed though. Since they took his stuff, Kim should be telling them, Hey, you didn't build that. <laughs> yeah. Put it back in their face. Exactly. Well, yeah. uh, you know, uh, um, go ahead, but also want to ask you to add, do you have any chance to get your money back? And then how much time are you potentially facing a uh, prison time? Well, the indictment is charging me uh, for 88 years, so they want to put me in jail Gosh. for 88 years. Gosh. And actually, the, the MPAA lawyer went on a radio station here in New Zealand and defending that and said, yeah, that's absolutely the, the punishment that he deserves. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's hilarious. I mean, they're so disconnected from reality, these Hollywood folks. It's just unbelievable. You know, 10 years ago, you would get a slap on the wrist uh, uh, if you downloaded something or did something wrong, and today they're talking about uh, decades in jail uh, for copyright infringement that I haven't even committed. That is the craziness about this uh, whole case. And by the way, uh, since this case uh, happened, no other case like it has happened anywhere in the world. This proves that this is a novel test case mm -hmm. for the Department of Justice. They burned mm -hmm. their fingers here. They will not do that again. Uh, and, uh, you know, I started a new site uh, called Mega in New Zealand uh, after the indictment. The first year anniversary of the raid, uh, I started this new site, and it was fully encrypted cloud storage. And today that site has uh, what, over 60 million users and is hosting 2 billion files. Wow. So, uh, and they haven't done anything to try and shut that down. Are you, are you, able to, are you making money from that, I hope? No, because Hollywood then went ahead. Uh, I Ugh. created a family. Listen, I, I created a family trust. I put all the shares uh, of the company into that trust, benefiting my kids and my wife. And Hollywood then went ahead and seized those shares uh, under a civil proceeding oh, to make God. sure that those funds are also not available. So Hollywood and the U.S. Uh, DOJ are working hand in hand uh, to destroy me and to keep me from having a fair. Uh, go in the courts. You That's should try really using sad. Bitcoin. It, it, it'd be really hard for them to take that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> let me just uh, say where we are now legally in New Zealand, right? Uh, we've just finished our court of uh, high court hearing uh, appeal against extradition. Uh, we have shown to the judge that under New Zealand law, there is no extradition offense because in New Zealand, online infringement is a purely civil matter. The Copyright Act in New Zealand creates the code that creates copyright. So copyright can only exist within that law. And that law says Internet service providers have no criminal liability. And there's even a safe harbor here in New Zealand that says that, that uh, you know, a service like Mega Upload is completely shielded from any kind of criminal uh, liability. And uh, in extradition, there's a thing called dual criminality. So something that isn't criminal in New Zealand, mm. I can't get extradited for. That makes so sense. So what, what did the U.S. government do? Get this. this is, it's getting more and more hilarious, their desperation, right? So they are now not relying on the Copyright Act anymore. They are saying this was a conspiracy to defraud. It's not what it's called in the indictment. They don't call it that in the indictment, but they say it's outside the, basically outside the Copyright Act. You have to look at the conduct. This is a, a, a fraud conduct, and we can extradite him for that. Yet the funny thing about it is that the Supreme Court of the United States has found that copyright can only be charged within the copyright uh, law, and fraud does not apply to copyright. Oh, my so God. So they already have cases 
uh, in their Supreme Court in the United States that have, that have completely dismissed this theory, that they are, that yet they are using it here in New Zealand to try and get me extradited. This whole case is such a clusterfuck of incompetence and maliciousness. Once it's all done, I really hope someone will make a series about it, like, you know, a five or ten episode uh, series to really put all of that to the light because it really makes the U.S. government look like clowns. Like, yeah, a real egg on their face. And there's more holes in what they're doing than, than Swiss cheese. I mean, I, I think every time you make a statement about uh, how unsubstantiated everything they're doing is, I think you're done. And then you throw out five more, and they're just committing crimes left and right by violating their own laws, by making stuff up and overreaching, and it, it and just fabricating stuff. And and I mean, it's like it's like a Kafka. It's like the trial by Kafka. I mean, it's like it, it's just unreal, surreal, and uh, crazy. You know, you remember the yeah. it was a like an animated series or a puppet series called The Dinosaurs. And they all worked for We Said So Corporation. <laughs> <laughs> That's appropriate, exactly. And you know, now here, here's another here's another important thing that a lot of people don't know, and it really shows how weak this case is. The U.S. government, through New Zealand Crown Law, has approached my lawyers twice to try and settle this case. They wanted me to accept some kind of new under New Zealand law copyright liability because they wanted to wash their hands from the risk if I go after them for damages when it turns out that everything that they have done was completely malicious, unlawful, and that it was a persecution for pay for Hollywood studios, right? So they wanted to find a way to settle this thing with me, and I told them to bugger off. I told them I'm not interested in any settlement. I'm going to see this through because this is much bigger than me. This is not just about me and my family, which has been suffering under this uh, pressure for the last five years. This is about internet freedom. This is about all of our rights. This is about Hollywood trying to stifle innovation and to shut down websites and to uh, uh, extend their power with their copyright extremism. And that's what I'm standing up against. And everything that I'm doing now that I've done with Mega and Mega Upload 2 and Bitcash and all of that is fighting that, uh, that progress that Hollywood is on with uh, their political allies to try and undermine our internet freedom. I'm combating that with technology. And that's what Mega Upload 2 is all about. So it's more than just a cloud storage site. It's a message uh, of everyone who loves the internet against this kind of conduct and saying, hey, I'm a user here and I'm supporting this because this is right and what you are doing is wrong. I agree. It's technology is free speech. It's technology is political activism. And frankly, you're a hero for everything you're doing. You know, if I were in your shoes, I might even take that sort of uh, settlement or compromise just out of fear for what they might try to do to me. But I respect your courage and your standing up for, like you said, not just yourself in your family, but for everybody in the future of the internet and its freedom. And uh, it's just like Ross Ulbricht in the Silk Road, uh, being a political, uh, uh, being politically persecuted, a political prisoner and, uh, you know, standing up for, uh, everyone else in the process and we thank you for that and we respect you for that and again i mean you're a real uh, champion of the people and hero for that and it's unfortunate that you have to suffer uh even if things turn out better uh in the meantime but let's talk more about what he was just discussing the future of uh, mega upload its sequel and then how that's being funded and set up and we'll be right back and whatnot it will be a mix of things. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about that shortly. Okay. <clears throat> All right. That'll be, yeah. I mean, stuff like that, that there's nothing they can do with it. Uh, just like Bitcoin. <laughs> they, they're going to have a hard time seizing your Bitcoin unless you, you know, give them, <laughs> give them the address. No, this, this isn't actually going to be decentralized. It is. It isn't, no. Oh, it is? It's, well, it's, it's, it's a company. Partner sites, partner sites yeah. are decentralized. Partner sites that we use for online storage. Mm -hmm. uh, Mega Upload 2 itself isn't decentralized. Okay. 
architects and engineers have concluded it was a controlled demolition. Over 6,000 of my fellow service members have given their lives. And thousands of my fellow first responders have died. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a structural engineer. New York City correct. I would like to find out, like, so Bitcash is, is essentially a, a different version of the Lightning Network? It's uh, similar to a certain extent, but uh, uh, a little bit more uh, simple, really, in its application. Okay. Uh, so if the block size becomes a problem, is there a possibility that you'll be using uh, altcoins to take up the slack or what? No, we're basically solving the uh, block size the limitation block size by taking by taking the microtransactions that Bitcash does off the blockchain. Okay. <clears throat> well, that's kind of kind of what the Lightning Network idea is. Mm, exactly. They. Uh, I think. I think the ma I think the major difference. Um, is the, the the Lightning Network is trying to solve a Bitcoin problem. Mm -hmm. um, Kim.com has a problem in that he wants to put billions and billions of transactions. Um, so he's coming at it from, is what my company needs to do. <clears throat> and, and it's a way of solving it um, purely for how to solve this specific user case. Whereas, so the, the, it's not, he, he doesn't think in the same way as all the Bitcoin people, which are just looking at how do we scale the blockchain. He's just thinking, you know, with, with all the beliefs and values and everything that comes from it, it right. it's more, here's a specific business case I need and I'm going to build some technology to do it. Yeah, I see it as okay. a temporary fix. Once the blockchain is fixed to be basically unlimited, we don't need to have things off the blockchain, you know? Cool. And I mean, yeah. could this be something that uh, you know Core could actually look at and <laughs> as being a way of solving the problem with the blockchain? Yeah, I think they're working on it. Cool. So yes, yeah, so it's, it's kind of just a difference. Whereas Kim's not coming from, um, you know, uh, here's what Bitcoin is. How do we improve it? He's coming from his his a, a, a user case I want to build. With billion, you know, millions and millions of users, um, how can I use Bitcoin? Oh, right, it doesn't quite work yet. Let me build something exactly. that allows me to exactly. use Bitcoin. Okay, um, well, let's yeah. get into that. We're so coming let's back. Get into that. Um, get into what mega upload is and all that, and then we'll get into Bitcash and how that uh, relates to the blockchain. Okay. Okay. Uh, bring us back, Deb, when you're ready. All about that Bitcoin. <laughs> All about that Bitcoin, about that Bitcoin. No one coin. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get a one coin? No. <laughs> <laughs> Please no. Welcome back, guys. We're in the second to last segment of the crypto show here on... Can I, can I go ahead and say something real quick? Go ahead. Uh, I guess Bruce Fenton just recently put out this letter against one coin. Oh, that's great. Will they do the same thing against BitClub or since BitClub... Gave money to the Bitcoin Foundation. Will that become a problem for them to speak out against BitClub? That sounds like a conflict of interest. No matter what you think about no BitClub, so, it, so I thought I should say it. That's an interesting point. That's a, a whole can of worms unto itself. Uh, have to get we'll Bruce see. On and ask him. We'll have to do that. We'll we'll see in the future what develops. Uh, we're talking with Kim dot com and Simon Dixon. And, uh, of course, in studio is Cody Wilson. He stepped out for a moment, probably his excitement over, <laughs> over the presidential debates. He'll be back in a moment, though. Um, so uh, Kim already kind of gave us a segue into the future of Mega Upload and the future of the Internet and the future of what Kim.com is doing. So let's get into that, Kim. And then, uh, of course, unfortunately, because the U.S. government has stolen all of your uh, hard-earned and uh, well-earned, uh, properly earned money, uh, you you clearly don't have your own funds to uh, create this new project. So uh, we'll get into how you're able to fund this new project uh, with Simon Dixon. So uh, get us started on that, Kim. Yeah, first of all, Simon Dixon and Bank to the Future they are my heroes. You know, they help me in this situation to basically uh, fund a new startup, uh, find the means to make this dream uh, possible of creating Mega Upload 2 and basically giving to the internet community a totally private uh, file sharing service 
where we don't even know the users, we don't know the user's IP, we don't know the contents of the files by design. So the technology is designed to keep us completely in the dark uh, about your private uh, use of your data. And in addition to that, uh, we're launching that with uh, a microtransaction service called BitCash. One of the big problems on the internet is that you can't purchase items, uh, uh, you know, content uh, for, let's say, three cents or five cents, you know, because the credit card uh, fees are prohibitive and there's really no solution for it. And I think, um, you know, if, if, if you have a successful uh, file sharing service and a user can upload a file that he owns and can put a small little price tag on it and every user that downloads it contributes like five cents or something on the fly without any major uh, uh, effort, uh, I think that would be a really fair system that would find mass appeal. And that's what I'm building. And there'd be a lot and more copyright has- compliance uh, in at that, right? Well, copyright compliance comes through uh, the laws anyway, so there will still be takedown procedures in place if a copyright or, owner isn't happy with yeah, the Yeah, yeah, or I, I simply mean that, down. like, the, the copyright holders, and I actually don't believe in copyright. Uh, copyright and patents, uh, intellectual property is not real property, but that's a whole other subject. But um, I'm just saying that, like, with micropayments like that, copyright owners could offer uh, copyrighted material for, you know, penny, a couple pennies and make money in more people would be likely to comply and some of these issues would be not so relevant. Um, yeah, completely correct. And we're designing BitCash for, for example, news publishers. You know, there's no mm-hmm. solution on the market right now where news publishers can charge a, a, a tiny amount for their content at all happening on the fly without ridiculous uh, transaction fees. There, there is a video There is a video service out there that actually does this, though. Oh, uh, yeah, actually. It's, it's uh, called Watch My Bit. Okay. And, uh, and that's, it, worth, that, that's what we were mentioning. It's a cool service. Yeah. Uh, what was the gentleman's name who started it? Uh, Doug Scribner. And, uh, yeah, cool we guy. Used we it, we used it last Pulco. year, actually, and uh, we did a video with Roger Ver, and it was about uh, what we had mentioned earlier, BitClub. And uh, all of the proceeds that, that came from the video, we just donated it. Uh, Roger donated his to FEE, and uh, we donated ours to, to Ross Ross Ulbricht, Ulbricht. Yeah, But anyway, but this mm. is, this is going to be a much broader, bigger thing. Right. That's what's so cool about it. So go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, Mega Upload 2 on day one will have a massive amount of users because I have access to 200 million users that signed up with us before. They are all eager to see the next mega upload. So we will have instant critical mass. And the challenge that I was really facing is, uh, yeah, this whole um, BitCash transaction system for microtransactions using Bitcoin is cool, but the blockchain has limitations. It can only do certain transactions per second, and uh, that is prohibitive to this type of venture. So I had to find a solution, a workaround, basically, until the blockchain is fixed and can handle more transactions per second than it currently can. Well, and real quick, uh, Danny had asked this uh, on air, although I didn't really hear the response because I just kind of walked back. Um, well, speaking of the, the transaction time with, with Bitcoin, uh, was there any consideration for any altcoins that had uh, faster turnaround times? I want to stick to Bitcoin because it's kind of the essential cryptocurrency. It's what everybody kind of have, has heard of and knows of. And, right. uh, you know, I, I, I personally favor it. Uh, there's no reason to go to other coins uh, as long as we can fix this uh, blockchain limitation Uh, also by taking it off the chain uh, we have our own fee structure which is allowing these kind of microtransactions and uh, so we we have a workaround for certain blockchain limitations that are currently in place and you introduce your bitcoin into bitcash and then when you when you have done your transaction with us you can take it out again. Uh, and since we are only de- dealing with microtransactions and, and never host uh, you know, thousands of Bitcoins per user at a time, it's also not really such a security risk or a security problem like with a lot of the other wallet providers because gotcha. we provide a wallet. So it's, it's, it's much more uh, simple and, and, and easier to use, really. Gotcha. Well, and... Um 
Well, I guess, well, well tell us more. Um, what is the timeline for this? Uh, how, how quickly do you see it being rolled out? Um, how much was Bank to the Future able to help bankroll you all thus far? Is that, I don't even know, is the fundraising still ongoing or was that already completed? No, we're still live at the moment. Okay, and how much time is left? In and fact, we, we, we've only just got started, really. 17 um, days. Is that right, 17 days? Well, hey, Simon, go ahead. Uh, 17 days, is that how much is left or how long and how much has been yeah, raised? And so, 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 I mean, yeah, so, you know, when, when we heard that, you know, Bank to the Future, we're an online investment platform for fintech. Um, when, when we heard Kim wanted to get into Bitcoin, it was always a case of, Wow, we you know we we'd love we'd love to figure out if we can do this. So it's a case of putting our legal counsel in touch with Kim's legal counsel, and and trying to figure out a way where you know this could be funded, um, and uh, Kim's counsel worked on some kind of protections whereby um, you know a, a structure whereby hopefully the U.S. can't seize that. Um, but you know this is this is a high risk venture, um, and we we've made all the kind of disclosures around that. Um, but yeah, so we, we, we launched it. Um, initially, we're doing a Bitcoin only phase at the moment. So um, we've raised close to half a million dollars nice. uh, Bitcoin only. Um, and uh, we, we're getting some feedback from the investor community. And, and after this show, uh, Kim and I are going to be um, making some follow on announcements uh, based upon the feedback that we've heard from the investors that have invested so far. Um, and then we're looking to raise up to five million dollars for this venture. Can can you give a short list of all the other crypto crypto things that uh, Bank to the Future has sponsored, just you know recently? Okay, I'll just give you a quick list. So um, Bitpayser, who's doing uh, Bitcoin payments in Africa, um, opening up international markets. We've got Shapeshift, who's a service like Kim.com. If they want to accept Bitcoin payments, they could simultaneously accept all the alternative coins, but they'll only deal with Bitcoin. Um, we've got uh, Kraken, one of the regulated exchanges in US. Storage, uh, file storage on the blockchain. Factum, allowing people to store data on the blockchain. Uh, Bitso, which is remittance payments, is in Mexico. Unocoin um, is an exchange in India with Bitcoin. One coin? No, Uno. Uh, we're, oh. we're definitely not touching one coin. I've been <laughs> vocal about that one. Sorry, Uno um, coin, one coin. I got it. <laughs> yeah, P please, if if anyone's listening, avoid run, run, and tell everyone <laughs> away from one coin. <laughs> well, indeed, yeah. Um, do you know what? I, sorry, I just a quick diversion because you put me there. Um, uh, <laughs> this the last two weeks, my my builder, my wife's makeup artist. Um, have all been asking me about whether they should invest in one coin. Are you kidding me? What it's, is, where it's does this come from? We, we it's actually deliberately targeted at them. We run we run a uh, PSA on this network warning people not to invest in one coin. So and no other, yeah, it, you know there's no other radio station around doing oh, that. Poor souls. Yeah. yeah and, so you know it's it's really duped a lot of very very you know people that don't know any better in and nobody that understands cryptocurrency is involved so fair enough hey real quick announcement too since i'm reminded um in arcapulco this year you can get a big percentage off your tickets if you use the discount code crypto the crypto show will be there and speaking of factum by the way paul snow of factum is also the uh ceo of uh the texas. founder sorry the texas bitcoin conference and the crypto show will be uh in charge of putting that on essentially with that foundation so it's exciting look forward to that we're going to talk more about uh in arcapulco tickets crypto uh discount code crypto and texas bitcoin conference anyway sorry and, and I, I also had a question for kim <clears throat> jeff berwick wants to know if you're an anarchist <laughs> i'm not an anarchist no okay <laughs> I, I have five kids you know i think uh, it's good that uh, there are laws that are protecting our children Fair enough, but you should still come to Narcopulco regardless. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Well, he can't, uh, he can't leave the country currently. Oh, so. that's a good point. That's a good point. Anyway, let's get back. Um, uh, so, uh, Simon, you uh, any other companies that you – a lot of cool ventures that – Basically, yeah, we'll, we'll leave we'll leave people to check it out. Um, they're, they're all listed, all the previous deals we've done, and you know, Factum was one of our our recent ones. Um, 
And so, yeah, let, let's, uh, people can check out the site if they want to see what we've done in the past. As they should, banktothefuture.com minus the A. And uh, speaking but if, of... But if you do use the A, it will redirect you because we own that domain. Um, oh, that's and, and right. That's the, right. The first time I was on your show, I said that's the, the, my final book when uh, Bank to the Future becomes a huge success and tries to create something as big as Kim.com created is uh, the, the final book I want to write is The Bank Stole My A. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I remember that. That's awesome. And you know what? Due to uh, regulations, Simon? you can't use the A. Right. And you know what, Simon? You are getting there uh, day by day. So well, it's with the good... $100 million raised, I mean, you guys are really getting big. So It's a good thing they protect us from the A. <laughs> of course, from the alphabet, <laughs> basically. This sounds like some perverse, bizarre world, uh, <laughs> what is Sesame Street or something. But anyway. Um, Brought well, to you by the letter A. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, speaking of storage, if, if I'm not mistaken, and get into this, Kim, uh, something like storage or made safe may play a role in Mega Upload 2? Yeah, Mega Upload 2 will be more of a caching service. So you upload to us, and then we're going to re upload uh, your file to, let's say, a dozen other uh, online storage providers and provide you with all these links so that you can be sure. You only have to upload a file once to us, and uh, you will have multiple options to access your file later from numerous different providers. But the beautiful thing is if you use us, uh, all your files will be packaged in this BitCache container, which allows you to make money with your files no matter where you store them. So that is really a, a breakthrough that a lot of people, I think, are going to appreciate. That's pretty awesome. I mean, this is very exciting stuff. Um, now, we've got five and a half minutes left. Um, Kim and Simon, I want y'all to, to uh, anything else we need to get out, let's get out. Um, I know it's a bit premature, but I want you to still nonetheless quickly uh, tell our listeners what tie-in there might be between Mega Upload 2 and, and MegaNet, which I know is still uh, off in the future, but uh, if you want to elaborate on that real quick. Yeah, well, Mega Upload 2 is really the stepping stone, you know, uh, it's the launch platform for both BitCash and later in the future, MegaNet. What you need for these services to succeed is critical mass. I know that if I get Mega Upload 2 fully funded, it will be one of the largest websites on the Internet. I have built numerous websites that made it into the Alexa Top 100. This one will be no different. And once we have 100 million users, it's quite easy to imagine that something like MegaNet would have instant critical mass on day one. And what I also like to say, you know, this show is, is, uh, is followed by a lot of Bitcoiners, a lot of people that are interested in cryptocurrencies. Mega Upload 2 and Bitcash can take Bitcoin to new highs. Mm -hmm. I've said on my Twitter before that I see Bitcoin in two, within two years trading at $2,000. And I oh. can do that just with my uh, venture with Mega Upload 2 and Bitcash because we are I going to it. increase the use of Bitcoin so significantly and we will make this uh, 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 you know, a tool that is used by everyone on the fly without even having to sign up to Bitcoin. For example, the first 5 million users to Mega Upload 2 will get a Bitcash wallet with some Bitcoin in there so that they can try out uh, the new system. And by that, you know, we're going to intru introduce Bitcoin to the masses. So anyone who's supporting uh, this venture is supporting Bitcoin in a big way and at the same time is supporting Internet freedom and my fight against the copyright extremists. And so they're, also, they're also good. being exposed to technologies like Made Safe and Storage so exactly. that they can get away from the cloud or even Demonsaw. Yeah, Demon Saw is a great example. You know, I love Aija. He's a great guy. He's working on some groundbreaking important stuff. And uh, at some point in the future, we'll work together. There's no doubt about it. And by groundbreaking stuff, Grand Theft Auto 6. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, pretty incredible stuff, and you're absolutely right. I mean, you have already proven your ability to create incredible technologies and to get people on board with them. I mean, 4% of the Internet, 13th most traffic site, the 1 billion page visits. I mean, only Gangnam Style, I think, may have exceeded that. <laughs> Actually, 1 billion unique 
users to our site. Oh, you need seven. users. Okay, yes. yeah, good. The, the, an important <laughs> difference. Thank you. Very yeah. true. And uh, you know, uh, even with your uh, New Zealand mega venture, you've got a lot of people. So there's a our, lot of potential. Our main listener audience is somewhere in Utah. What is it? The NSA, NSA office. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you got that right. So it's really exciting. And like you said, I mean, one man and his project can make a difference when it comes to even Bitcoin. You could easily get a ton of people uh, crowding into Bitcoin, driving up the price, driving up adoption with this service. And uh, that would be a, a boon, not just to Bitcoin holders currently, but to everybody who could benefit from Bitcoin, uh, its technology, its uh, anti-censorship and pro-anonymity uh, features and all that, and so this is really important and an amazing thing. Well, you can, mean no? You mean someone won't be stealing my identity because I'm using? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. I didn't, I didn't have to enter a credit card. No, you did our social security number. Oh my god! Well, a minute and a half left. Uh, Kim dot com. Simon Dixon, uh, finish us off. Yeah, well, I, I just want to say that um, you know, for, for us, this was a, a huge, risky thing to get involved with. But on, on the missionary side, you know, we, we're all about changing the future of finance for the better. Um, but purely on a self-interest side, um, we've got a, a large portfolio in the Bitcoin sector, um, and so supporting Kim dot com in this venture, um, we believe is is good for Bitcoin and good for our portfolio. Uh, because we, you know, we believe he can bring a lot, a lot of new ventures. Um, sorry, a lot of a, lo a lot of new users to the the Bitcoin sector. So we we we, we had to find a way. Um, and I, I do just want to say on a, on a final note, you know, this is this is a it is a high risk venture. We we take accredited investors only. But all the investors that have built some wealth in the Bitcoin sector, or you know, and and or others as well, um, you know, it's uh, we we're, we're we're looking at. Uh, a high return potential with a, with a very high risk for people that can afford to sustain the, the right. risk if this goes but wrong. But they probably know what they're doing, those investors, to get there. 20 seconds. Kim.com, take us out. I would take Bitcoin mainstream if you help me help you. I need Bitcoiners <laughs> out there to support my project, and I will take Bitcoin mainstream. You have my word. Life lessons from Jerry Maguire, according to Kim.com. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Excellent show. We'll see you all next time.